Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest State of .NET webinar, Microsoft Build Recap. Today, Marcus is going to focus exclusively on the latest news, announcements, and developments from last week's Microsoft Build event. My name is Jim Duffy, and I'm the Director of Business Development here at Code. I was a developer and training instructor back in the day, but I've been lured to the dark side, and now I'm responsible for the marketing and sales efforts for all of our Code services, including Code Magazine, of course. But Code is so much more than just a magazine. Yes, Code Magazine is our flagship and probably how you know about us, but our other divisions include Code Consulting, where we do custom software development work, Code Training and Mentoring, and Code Staffing. If you're interested in reaching out about any of our Code services, my email address is on this slide. Just a quick shout out here about Fotino. Fotino is an open source project that the Code team is involved with that allows developers to create native cross-platform applications using web development technology. You can leverage your HTML and CSS and JavaScript skills to create apps that run on Windows, Linux, and the Mac. It's like Electron, only smaller and much more lightweight. Learn more at tryfotino.io. Code Magazine is the leading software development magazine written by expert developers for developers. As a benefit for attending, all registered attendees will automatically receive a free digital Code Magazine subscription, provided you don't already subscribe. I've also included a free subscription link for you to share freely with others who couldn't make it to the webinar today. Our presenter is Marcus Egger. Marcus is the big kahuna around here. He's the Code President and Chief Software Architect, Publisher of Code Magazine, International Author and Speaker, Microsoft Regional Director, Excellent Golfer, and All-Around Nice Guy. Our continuing mission is to help people build better software. We're a Microsoft partner and provide a number of services, including building custom software solutions on-prem and in the cloud, modernizing legacy applications, educating developers, providing developer resources to augment your development team, and supporting and maintaining existing applications. Our team of expert developers and consultants are ready to help you with your project. Our very popular and in-demand free hour of code provides an opportunity for you and or your team to meet with our handpicked expert team to discuss anything you could use our help with. Schedule your call today and let us help. No charge, no strings, no commitment, just free help from our code experts. Slots are limited, so reach out to me about getting your free hour of code scheduled for you and your team. If you like what you see today or have seen in our prior webinars, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. We would like your feedback about this webinar in the form of a quick survey, and we're willing to pay 100 bucks in the form of an Amazon e-card to one lucky attendee. A name will be drawn from the entire webinar's registered attendee list, and a completed survey is required to qualify for the e-card. If the selected name hasn't completed a survey, another name is going to be selected, and so on. You don't want to be that person whose name is selected only to lose out because you failed to complete the survey, right? Right? The survey is very short, and you'll finish it in no time flat. The survey link is on the slide, and we'll post the survey link in the chat window as well. It's almost time to turn things over to Marcus, but before I do, I want to share with you that the slides and recordings of today's webinar, and all of our webinars, will be available on the stateof.net page on the code website. I've included that link here. If this is your first time attending one of our webinars, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. If you have attended a webinar in the past, Welcome back. Okay, you've heard enough from me. Thanks for listening. Take it away, Marcus. Thank you, Jim. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, it's that time of the month again where we do a state.net event uh, or actually a week late this time uh, due to build. Uh, I see a ton of people from around the world have signed up again from just about any time zone. So. Good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, wherever you might be. Uh, pretty early morning for me where I'm at. Uh, looking forward to today's event. Uh, this is going to be interesting. Uh, we're going to look at what happened at Microsoft Build last week. Uh, the event has been quite interesting in a lot of ways. We'll talk about that. Uh, what we're going to focus on, of course, is what is happening for developers. Uh, we are a developer company, we always look at everything with a developer hat on. 
So that's what we're going to focus on within what was announced at Build. We're going to talk about various announcements. We're going to talk about what was announced for different platforms. Uh, in today's event, I'm going to talk, of course, a little bit about Azure, but we've talked a lot about Azure in recent times. Last month's Stato.net was entirely focused on Azure. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, but we'll mostly focus on other things. Now, there's some very interesting things on the horizon. Got some stuff around .NET, of course. Uh, we got various other development areas that we are talking about. But one of the things I want to do in this event is I want to branch out a little bit. I'm hoping that everybody comes away from this event with a slightly different outlook on development because I think the development landscape is rapidly changing. The things that have happened over the last year, year and a half, uh, the pandemic, the crisis, the, the fallout of that, is changing things quite considerably and uh, we want to take a look at what that means and show you some new development opportunities that like I said I'm hoping you come away with a slightly different outlook on, on the development world and where your opportunities might lie so that's what we want to take a look at some of the things we're looking at are either relatively early in tech or some of them are also relatively complex in their setup in terms of doing a demonstration and we already have a fairly complex setup here with our uh, code studio, with uh, the streaming, the live streaming, the recording, the different machines that are involved in that. So as a result of that, I'm doing something I've never done again in these live events. And that is I actually have two pre-recorded samples that I recorded a few hours ago. Uh, so we will take a look at those as well and we'll see uh, a number of samples. Uh, well, just go live into the codes. So it's going to be a healthy mix. Hopefully there's a little bit for everyone. Now you're gonna see me look over here every now and then uh, because that is where I have uh, my minions working uh, on answering questions. If you have any questions, feel free to ask those live or feel free to contact us after the event, but you'll see me look over here every now and then to monitor my question feed and I'll, I'll try to answer some of them as we go and I'll do uh, some of them at the end of the session as well. So let's dive into it. Let's take a look at what happened at Build in general. And I uh, kind of borrowed some of the fancy artwork Microsoft had at Build here. So what was Build like? Uh, well, Build was another virtual event. Uh, this is actually the second time around that Build was virtual uh, as we're now in this for more than a year. Uh, it was an interesting setup. Microsoft uh, has evolved a lot since the last build in 2020 that was kind of short notice for a virtual event we had a lot of very professionally done sessions that really took advantage of this new uh, mode where microsoft's breaking out of the typical session format where you have somebody stand in front of the audience uh, in a conference room so it was nice to see uh, that that is happening build was also somewhat smaller in scope this year uh, in the past, Build was always massive. There was a huge number of breakout sessions. Now, they still had a, a fair number of sessions, but not quite as many as before. And that is because Microsoft starting to break things into multiple smaller events. So uh, you will see that there will be more of what they call what's next events. And I'll talk about that a little bit as we talk about different topics. Um, for instance, there will be an event in November around what's next in .NET or that will be the, the .NET 6 launch event. And so we are seeing more and more of that with are smaller events and therefore Build itself was a little smaller. The main kickoff of Build was such an Adela's keynote. We're seeing a photo of the man right here. Keynote was interesting uh, and took 17 minutes total. So that was a little different from what we would normally expect at a Build. Uh, that keynote was not as beefy as uh, we'd have come to expect. But nevertheless, uh, he dropped some very interesting nuggets of information, which we will digest here. And so that, uh, that should be quite interesting. Uh, what were the major announcements at Build? Well, there was no major surprises this year. Uh, we didn't expect any, and that's how it turned out to be. So Build is turning into an event that is kind of a steady event, if you want to think of it like that. We had the usual announcements around Azure, Azure becoming a much more mature platform. Therefore, we don't have these huge amount of announcements. Now, Azure is a hundred and some services at this point, 
every service had pretty substantial uh, improvements. So Azure obviously is, is moving along nicely with uh, a lot of interesting stuff happening, but there were no huge announcements that were like, oh man, I really didn't expect that or, or this turns everything upside down. We didn't have any of that. Uh, so there's Azure news, there's .NET news, Visual Studio, of course, a new version is on the horizon. A big theme, of course, is AI and machine learning, which is becoming more and more important and moving into everything. And our ability as developers to use that as well is, is very important. Uh, there were announcements around data, um, mostly incremental, mostly things around uh, you can do more data for, for less money, you can do more for free, that type of stuff. But an, a very interesting development, uh, and that's one of the key things for you to take home, I think, is the emergence of the collaborative app. And I think that's an outcome of the current crisis, uh, the work from home wave that is here to stay. It's become clear that even though people are looking forward to going back to the office, even though we are opening up offices around the world, uh, slower in some areas than other, but there's clearly a move back to that. It's gradual and the work from home thing is not gonna disappear. And that's led to a collaborative application landscape that we haven't seen before. And so that's a major theme of this year's build. There's also a return of what I call no dev apps. Um, and we'll talk about that in more detail as well. Now I have some information here that came from the keynote. Uh, so this is data that Satya shared with us. Uh, I don't always have the sources for that, but take a look at the Microsoft keynote as well. But I have no reason to doubt this data. So here are some of the things that Satya shared with us. Um, the role of tech in the world is becoming more and more important. Now that's not news. Uh, I could have said that every year for the last 30 years. But what's very interesting is how much more important tech is in the world. So in terms of overall GDP, how much of that is made up by tech that is growing from five to 10% in a very rapid fashion. So it's basically doubling in significance, doubling in size. And when you think of all the, the, the business, all the entire world economy, and that we are essentially making up 10% of that now, that is unbelievable, really, if you think about it like that. Uh, the digital transformation has sped up drastically. So all the things that we saw coming for the next 10 years, they have pretty much happened in a year. And again, the role of tech is super important. When you look at what the hiring landscape is like these days, tech hiring is way outpacing any other hiring in the world. In fact, tech hiring is, is outpacing high, all other kinds of hiring, even in non-tech firms. So take just about any company in the world, throw a dart. Uh, when you look at who they are hiring, more than half the people they're hiring are tech related these days. Uh, so tremendous opportunity. Microsoft says they're estimating 5 million new applications will be built in the next five years. Now I have no way to back up this data, but that's massive. That is more apps will be built in the next five years than were built in the last year. I don't know how they count that. Do they count every little app? What, whatever the case might be, the, the point is, we expect in the next five years, there will be more applications built than were built in the last 40 years combined. Uh, the demand for new apps in the IT department is drastic. Uh, we now know that we would have to build apps about five times faster to meet the demand, then we can build them. Think about that. That means 80% of the app needs go unfulfilled or are fulfilled late. Uh, so that's tremendous. That's a very interesting problem to solve. How do we speed up development of apps and still deliver high quality of apps? Uh, the velocity, the, the productivity, all those things are tremendously important. And so whether these numbers, where they come from, whether they're exactly right or not, uh, I think is kind of besides the point. The point is developer opportunity in the current world of development 
is just dramatic. Uh, we've never seen this much developer opportunity. We've never seen that it was this hard to hire good developers. Uh, we've never seen the demand for productivity, even within already productive groups of developers, to be as high as it is right now. And we need new approaches to meet that demand. Um, so anyway, those were some of the major themes that Microsoft shared with us in the keynote at Build. And this is kind of what sets the stage for a lot of the things that we want to talk about today. Now let's dive into individual topics uh, and look at them with a developer eye and see what it means to us. And Build started out as a Windows developer event. In fact, there still is buildwindows.com. Uh, as one of the main URLs to get to the build content. So let's talk about Windows and let's talk about what's new with Windows. Now, in a way, there was surprisingly little event, a little content about Windows itself. Um, but uh, what we know at this point is a major new update has rolled out just recently. It's called the 21H1, first half year of 21. Uh, the 21H1 update has rolled out. It has many of the usual fixes <clears throat> you would expect. Uh, when you just look at it on the surface, it's not a major new build, but under the hood, a number of things have changed. Uh, a lot of that is stuff Microsoft is not yet talking about. But one of the things that I got out of build and that I see happening in all kinds of areas is that there is a major push towards ARM and supporting ARM architecture. Uh, how do we currently see that? It doesn't surface all that much, but it's a theme that is happening th throughout. So while it's only been a little tiny tidbit of information in a lot of different talks, this theme is now happening all over. And so we're expecting this to become quite important. There's also a new Qualcomm ARM dev kit in a box where you can buy a little device uh, as a dev kit for ARM. So, so these things are brewing and we know there's something coming there. Uh, we also know that Microsoft keeps adding more and more support for Linux. Uh, one of the major new features in this window is Linux GUI support for different uh, builds. So if you are a, a UI developer developing Linux apps, you can now run that directly in Windows. So what's happening with Windows in the future? We really don't know a whole lot about that. We know that there's a major update coming in the fall uh, known as the Sun Valley update. We know that's going to be pretty big and we know that that is supposed to include an overhaul of the, the user experience. So we expect some changes in looks, some changes in how the UX is going to flow. So that's going to be fairly important. We're looking forward to that. We also have the expectation, and this is not um, confirmed by Microsoft, but there's a lot of talk about that. Uh, people like Mary Jo Foley are talking about that. We're expecting there to be a new Windows Store uh, that provides more broad opportunity in terms of running out, win uh, rolling out Windows applications. So, so that could be very interesting. Um, when are we going to know more about that? Well, not at last week's build. So there's little information about that, but the expectation is that that will be one of those what's next events over the next few weeks, probably in the summer time frame at some point where we should hear quite a bit more about that. And that could be quite interesting. So be on the lookout for that. This could be some major news for developers. Um, Another thing that's related to Windows is Microsoft Edge. Uh, Edge is uh, the browser, if you haven't uh, looked into that. The uh, short version is Microsoft has basically teamed up with Google and is now a major contributor, the biggest contributor, in fact, to the Chromium open source project. Edge is the browser that's now entirely based on Chrome. So if you haven't tried that, give it a chance. Uh, this is actually a really good browser. It's my default browser after having used Chrome for years and Microsoft is very rapidly developing, is very rapidly contributing to the Chromium project, but also contributing or building its own Edge browser with all kinds of feature around the core Chromium engine. Uh, some of the new things are sleeping tabs, some of the new things are startup boost, a performance improvement that's been relatively substantial. Also, Edge is available in this WebView 2 version. Now, this is very important for us as a developer. We'll talk about that some more later. 
But basically WebView 2 allows you to embed Edge inside your applications and get a very modern and more lightweight browser in your apps than rolling out Chromium. Uh, but being 100% compatible with Chromium because it is based on the Chromium engine. So that's been around for a while. I consider that part of Windows news and that's worked out really well. Uh, there's a question online about a Qualcomm dev kit that uh, you can watch some of the sessions, uh, especially around what's new with desktop development. If you go watch the build sessions on demand, there's tidbits of information about that. It's basically a dev kit in a box. That's an ARM based dev kit uh, that's about this big. Uh, hold my hands into the camera, uh, just an appliance basically. And you'll be able to order that this summer, but they haven't really made a whole lot more information available around that. So that's really it for Windows news. There wasn't a whole lot more than that, uh, but let's actually dive into the core dev topics and let's talk about our development ecosystem, .NET, Visual Studio, and anything related to that even inside of Azure. So the .NET ecosystem is growing and it's been very popular. So the whole .NET core push or wave has been super interesting. Uh, we now know there's more than 5 million <coughs> daily developers in the .NET ecosystem. We know that the framework is very well loved. Uh, a lot of the .NET stuff is very, very high velocity in the open source community. And for those of you who are still doubting Microsoft as an open source company, Microsoft is actually the biggest contributor to open source at this point. So there's a lot going on. C Sharp is a top five language on GitHub. Uh, the performance is great. Uh, I, the number that's on here is seven times faster for ASP.NET Core than Node.js. Uh, it always depends on how, how you measure that, what exact features. Uh, I've actually seen some updated versions or, or different versions, I should say, of this slide where they claim 10 times performance compared to Node.js. Whatever the case might be, the point is it's, it's very fast, considerably faster than Node.js. It's interesting to see that we have a lot of new people come in. We, we know that a lot of new people are coming in even from the student uh, community. So that's been a sore point for .NET for a long time. And it's interesting to see that that happens. .NET Core uh, 3.1 was the fastest adopted version of .NET with uh, over 3 million total developers coming in in I think uh, if I remember correctly six months or some relatively short time frame. This has only been topped recently by .NET 5. .NET 5 has been adopted even faster than .NET Core 3.1. I think they added about 3.6 million developers in the, t in the same time frame. So long story short, this is a very, very popular and fast growing and, and very vibrant and alive ecosystem that really got rejuvenated by everything happening around core and then beyond. Uh, .NET 5 has now been available for well over half a year, very well perceived performance, like I said, very, very good. So that's all good things to know. Here is uh, another example of how this is growing and by the way all these slides will be available after this event you can download them so if you have a boss that's like well i don't know if you should use .NET. do we have some data here is some data around that uh, it is growing very very fast and it's very well received now let's talk about dotnet 6 a little bit uh, .NET 6 is now on the horizon it will release in uh, November of 2021, the release event is already set. It will be from November 9th to uh, November 11th. Uh, and there will be another .NET Conf online event, which has now become the annual release cycle of .NET. So .NET 6 is where this concept of one .NET will come full circle. Uh, so .NET 5 was aiming to be that, uh, that got delayed a little bit in some areas, partially due to the pandemic, partially due to other reasons. The point about .NET 6 or 1.NET, that code name that you may have heard, is that we want to have a single .NET. Over the years, .NET has kind of splintered into a number of different flavors of .NET, whether that is the original full .NET framework whether that is the new .NET Core engine, whether that is .NET for IoT, whether that is the Mono project and the things that were done for mobile devices. 
all those things splintered and we had these different .NET frameworks, these different .NET runtimes. Uh, you had the ability to target different platforms. There was things like .NET standard to try to, to control that splintering of things. But it was difficult to build for all these uh, different uh, environments and still share the same code base. And .NET 6 or 1.NET is trying to fix all that. And with .NET 6, we're coming full circle. With .NET 5, we've already had things like the ability to run Windows apps, whether that's WinForms, whether that is WPF, on the same new .NET 5 platform. But there were things missing. Uh, the Samarin guys, for instance, didn't quite get their stuff done on time. And so there's things like that that are all being brought together and it's really finishing that vision of a reunified .NET 6 platform on which everything will run. So that's a, a huge step forward and we'll see that come to fruition with, uh, with this November uh, 21 release and you'll see annual releases going forward that's already planned out you can look at the roadmap online you can look at the roadmap in some of our prior um, uh, state.net events but it's gonna be this annual release with releases every November and this is gonna be a big one now you can currently download the preview 4 version of .NET 6 uh, it's largely very stable with some exceptions we'll talk about that you can download that as a preview. You can use it in Visual Studio 2019. However, not in your regular version of Visual Studio 19. There's a Visual Studio 2019 preview that you can download and that you will need to download to use all the new things to get support for that. Uh, so that's available now. Go ahead, try that out. You can run it side by side with your other version of Visual Studio 2019. So I've been doing that for a long time. The two Visual Studio 2019s update in parallel don't step on each other's toes and uh, and that works very well now on the horizon is visual studio 2022 um, that is not yet available as a preview build but it will be available as a preview build later this summer uh, that's a huge new release uh, it's the first major new release whatever the version number really do the name changes in three plus years this is going to be the first real 64-bit version of Visual Studio. So that's pretty major. What is, going to, uh, what is that going to do to you? Well, first of all, it's going to be a performance improvement. It's going to take advantage of uh, more memory. Yes, it benefits to have more memory for a 64-bit version. But it's, uh, again, major performance improvements. Uh, it's support for .NET 6, it should say here, or 1.NET, uh, just the latest and greatest. Also support for C++ 20. It has a little bit of a streamlined updated UI, although you'll certainly still recognize it as Visual Studio, uh, but it's uh, improved in details as far as the UI experience go. It's, it's kind of the same as every Visual Studio release. It's streamlined, it's fo letting you focus on your code a bit more, uh, latest and greatest UI updates, and many of the new features that Microsoft has talked about at build really work well in Visual Studio 2022 and don't necessarily work in Visual Studio uh, 2019 preview. For instance, one of the really nice things in Visual Studio 2022 is the debugging improve, uh, experience has improved. There's a, a feature called Hot Reload, for instance, which is it's almost like an edit and continue on steroids where you can do massive changes to the app you're debugging while it is running. So if you have a large app and you have to launch it, you have to log in, you have to navigate through the app to get to where you want to be. Uh, and then you're like, oh, damn, I wish I would have made that chan chan uh, change. You can now do that with Hot Reload. And it's a feature I really wanted to demo here today because it is super cool and powerful. But unfortunately, it's not working really well in Visual Studio 2019, or at least it didn't work very well for me but it works really well in Visual Studio 22. So there's some very interesting stuff coming there. And I encourage you to check that out as soon as that preview is available in the summer. And again, you can download that. You can run it side by side with your uh, other versions of Visual Studio. So do it once it becomes available. Also, there will be an update for Visual Studio for the Mac. There's a little bit of a side note here, but it's another very interesting thing coming from the Visual Studio team. 
uh, it will use all the latest and the greatest native Mac UI um, uh, frameworks that Apple has put out. So side note, but nevertheless, very interesting. Now I'm not talking specifically about Visual Studio Code here in this particular talk. Needless to say, Visual Studio Code is very important. I'm not giving it a lot of love here because it's getting plenty of love everywhere else. But Visual Studio Code certainly is super important and, and something that will remain important and being brought forward very, very quickly. Uh, so uh, not to worry about that either. Now going into the dev specifics a bit more, I've picked out a few areas that I think are very, very interesting. And in fact, one of the themes that reappeared at Build was what we call project reunion or anything revolving around the same sort of thing. What is project reunion? It is a unification, a reunification of all the Windows development technologies. So uh, just like .NET, Windows development splintered over the recent years. We had things like WinUI uh, and UWP, the universal Windows platform that got developed over the years, all the way back to Windows 8 with the WinRT releases. Uh, those technologies were fundamentally different and siloed and, and separate from things like WinForms and WPF. Now, as a lot of the things in the Windows 8 timeframe, uh, I, you know, I, I can call a spade a spade here because I'm not a Microsoft guy. A lot of mistakes were made in the Windows 8 timeframe. And a lot of what we are seeing with the things that are going on now are really fixing those mistakes. And one of those mistakes was to have these silos of different uh, UI technologies for desktop applications. And that's all being reunified. So what Project Reunion is all about is the ability to use all WinUI technologies in any other WinUI technology. So if you're building a WinForms app, for instance, or a WPF app, and you want to continue building that. First of all, it now runs on .NET 5 and will run on .NET 6. So that's important, bringing all that older code forward and giving it a future. And the nice thing is you can now combine that with any WinUI or, or UWP or whatever other development technology. So it is absolutely possible to build a WinForms app that uses some of the latest and greatest WinUI, even though WinUI comes from a completely different team. WinForms, WPF, uh, those are all technologies written by the .NET team. WinUI is a technology that comes from uh, the Windows team. And those things are now all combined with Project Reunion to be usable in all your apps. In fact, I have a, a little sample here uh, of an app that I already started. This is a, a real world app that we use internally. Now this is a WinForms app. I know it doesn't look like it, but this is a WinForms app that's been around for 20 years that we've upgraded over time uh, and it's our back office system. And this is what we use to run our own business. So for instance, it has this, uh, this item in here to search for articles because we are not just a consulting company, but as you know, we also own a magazine. So this is our database of articles and I can go in here and I can look at a specific issue and I can look at the you know, articles that are in here. Now, this is an interesting app. Like I said, it's based on WinForms, but WinForms now runs on all modern .NET uh, environments. So you can bring it forward to .NET 5, .NET 6. This is pinging an API that runs in Azure. So this is a REST API that's serving up this data. And we can now go into any of these uh, articles that we have here. And you see it sits there and loads the article in a typical edit form. But we also have a tab in here to edit the actual article itself. And as you can see, this is a markdown editor that sits inside of this WinForms app. And we have a, an HTML based preview of the article. So that's how our editors work with our article content. And the way this works is it is using Project Reunion and it is embedding web technologies in this case inside of our WinForms app. Or I can go in here and I can say, I wanna look at some documentation. The documentation is a web view to control embedded inside of the app that shows us a web app. And we could go in here and we could look at different content right in here. And this is a modern evergreen web browser that is combined into a very old WinForms app here to provide this functionality. And we can do the same thing 
with all kinds of other modern UI technologies. So we could have Win UI things that are brought in so it looks more like a universal app with, with all the transparency and the cool animations. And all of that would work in WinForms or WPF and vice versa. So interesting real world application there that uses this technology and it works really well and it enabled us to protect our investment. That's really what a lot of that is all about. So where are we at with Project Reunion? Version 0.5 has been available in March. And the important thing about that is it includes that WebView 2 capability for all platforms and it includes WinUI 3 for all platforms. So you can host all of that within any uh, framework or platform of choice that's uh, sitting on top of Windows. Goes back to an early version of Windows 10, which hopefully most people are gonna be on right now. Uh, WinUI 3, you can't use in anything older than Windows 10, basically. WebView 2 is much more flexible in that it works back to Windows 7. Uh, so a question online is, does WinForms on the .NET 5 support binding to implement MVVM? Well, WinForms supports data binding and as such, you can use the MVVM pattern and we do that quite a bit. It's not as good as WPF or, or UWP or any of those that are really built around this concept of data binding where you can bind super advanced things, including complete other UIs. And so when you, if you're a user of a code framework, for instance, our application framework uh, that has a WPF component, that framework is almost entirely built on this idea of binding UIs into other UIs and being very complex around that. WinForms doesn't change fundamentally, it's still WinForms, uh, but it has data binding capabilities to a point where you can use the MVVM pattern. So we are doing that. So anyway, so uh, 0 0.5 has been available since March. 0 0.8 is now out, uh, supports .NET 5, uh, that was new, before it was uh, 3.1. Uh, also improves ARM support, so there it is again, that nugget of information, and there's just general improvements that are available. And now people are gonna say, well, zero point whatever versions are not really what we are supposed to use in production. They're not real supported version. That is not correct. In this case, the point X versions, the zero point X versions, are fully supported versions uh, of Project Reunion. Um, so you get Microsoft support for that, like for all other projects or all other technologies, even though they're zero point whatever. Uh, 1.0 release is planned for the fall, very likely in line with .NET 6, I would imagine. Uh, no specific dates being given, but that's my assumption there. Uh, so that should come in the fall and be uh, the big official release. And, uh, and that's working really well. I can highly recommend that. We've used this in a lot of different projects. And so that's kind of interesting. Now, another very interesting development, uh, let me get my mouse cursor back here and switch to my next slide, is Project Maui. Uh, Project Maui is very interesting, not just because Maui, the island, is my home, but uh, because this is just some very interesting UI technology. Maui stands for Microsoft Multi Application, uh, excuse me, Microsoft Multi Platform Application UI is what Maui stands for. And what this is, is it's basically an evolution of the Samarin's Forum Toolkit. So if you've been a mobile developer, you know what this is. Samarin is this ability to build .NET applications for mobile devices. Uh, including iOS, including Android. And then Samarin also in the past has worked for the Mac, it's worked uh, for Windows even, but the Windows story kind of fell by the wayside. So there was this story about building universal apps and then some of the templates started to disappear and in and, and the end, Samarin was for building mobile apps. Uh, but now this is gonna change with Project Maui, this drives forward this unification of all UIs. So all these things you can build uh, with all these different components now are unified under MAUI and MAUI is a great way to build Windows applications. It supports things like WinUI 3, all the things we just talked about for Project Reunion, but it also supports the mobile stuff. So this is gonna be going forward the way to build applications for Android, iOS, Mac OS, and Windows, and all of these are first class citizens. And in the past, I've said, I'm not totally sure how Maui is gonna develop. Is this this little thing that's coming from the Samarin guys that, that most of Microsoft's gonna ignore, or is this gonna be a big thing? 
Now it hasn't rolled out yet. It's going to ship with .NET 6 this fall, but it's available as a preview and it seems to be at least a very big deal. There's a lot of talk around that. Uh, it's the kind of thing that Microsoft talks about in keynotes and as the big way forward. So it sure seems like this is as big a deal as a lot of people were hoping that it's going to be. I, I have a brief sample here. Uh, so this is Visual Studio uh, 2019 preview, as you can see here up in the top right corner. Looks a lot the same as it was before, but here is my Maui application. You can see this is still very much what you would expect if you have been a WPF or a UWP developer, or a WinUI developer in the past, or a, of course, Xamarin mobile developer, because we have things like our SAML files, and this is how you build your UI currently. Uh, there's no designer support. Well, uh, that's supposed to come later, I guess. But you're building these applications the way you are used to them. And if I then just go ahead and run this, in this case, I'm targeting Windows as a platform. And you can choose what are you targeting with this UI technology. Uh, so I could totally write a multi-platform app that runs on mobile devices or tablets as well as Windows. But in this case, I'm targeting Windows. This is a, a weather example that you can download. It always takes a while to compile that the first time, but it should be starting up here momentarily. And then you'll see this is gonna be a full-blown universal app as we would call the UWP app, modern Windows app, whatever you want to call that. Um, that just looks and feels like a modern Windows app, but it also works well on mobile devices. And so here it comes. Uh, Always takes a bit longer when I'm in demo mode with all the streaming going. You can see it loading down here and it's deploying in this case, it's UWP system and it opened on my other screen, but here it is. This is this weather app and you'll see as we resize this, it behaves nicely on small devices and so on. We can go into different areas of this app. Looks like a modern, nice app that uses all the cool WinUI, fluid UI, modern UI methodology. Uh, but it's built as a Maui app that uses these technologies. And if I target this also into another platform like Android, like iOS, like the Mac, then we'll see the same type of UI. Uh, we have deep integration with each local environment. So if we were to look at the source code here and we looked at the startup, you would see that you can build things that are targeted for different UIs. So you can say, hey, I wanna do tray notifications, but that works different in Windows from how it would work on the Mac Catalyst uh, platform. Uh, and so you can just target that where needed, but by and large, you use your same code throughout your application. Uh, so that's just a quick look at Maui. Now a word of warning here, uh, in all fairness, I've played around with Maui quite a bit. I find it to be very rough currently. I'm hoping uh, for Visual Studio 2020, uh, 22, once that preview is available, that the experience will get a lot smoother. And then certainly when it ships uh, in the fall, we expect uh, all of that to be the smooth experience to build new desktop applications. Uh, so that is something that's coming, but I do find it quite rough right now. Uh, I would give it a few more months before I actually start building real things on top of that because it is a little bit of a rough development experience currently. But then again, it is preview software. We've gotten so accustomed to preview software being very solid uh, with this, it's uh, not my experience. Another uh, detail that I want to point out here, Maui is going to support Android, iOS, Mac OS, Windows. The one thing that's obviously missing here is Linux. Uh, there's no current Linux support. Microsoft uh, keeps that door open uh, if there's enough interest, but currently that's not uh, a supported platform. So that's something to be aware of there. Um, I also got another slide here that shows a little more how this works. And then uh, it's, of course, an open source project. You can join it on GitHub. Um, 
Moving on, I want to point out uh, that we had a big uh, Stata.net event this February, so a few months back, focused entirely on Windows desktop development. So if you are interested in more about that, more about Project Reunion, the online recording for that event is still available. Uh, available to you to watch for free, just go to stateof.net.com. An interesting side note here, we expected a Windows desktop development focused event to be niche, to be one of our smaller events. Uh, we thought that people that were interested in it would be very interested, but we thought it would be a smaller event. We couldn't have been more wrong. This was our second most popular event ever. Uh, only topped by .NET 5, uh, by the .NET 5 focused uh, state of .NET. So it's clear that desktop development is alive and well and garners much more interest than we would have thought. And so if you are in that camp that's interested in that, go back, watch that. Um, it's, it's an interesting event. Now some questions online. What is the difference between Maui and Blazor? Well, Maui is a Windows or let me back up. Maui is a desktop development environment that's cross-platform, including Windows and all these other platforms that we talked about. But it's based on .NET, on the .NET runtime. Uh, there's no browser involved. There's no HTML type of environment involved. Now, you can use HTML as a technology to build UIs, but it's not the typical uh, browser, uh, running in a browser, going to a server type of environment. It's a desktop development environment running natively on those in, uh, platforms. Blazor is a browser technology, either running server-side or running client-side inside the browser, on, uh, in many cases on top of WebAssembly. So it's a way to run .NET on this .NET platform that is .NET 5 based, but it's a different implementation under the hood. Uh, so a little bit different. However, you can combine the two things. So it's possible to run Blazor within Maui, for instance. So it's, it's two different technologies uh, targeting slightly different areas. One is web dev, one is desktop dev, but you can combine them and it's part of this reuniting of all the UI technologies. Uh, are COM components supported in uh, .NET 5? I I have to admit, I'm not sure what the latest is on that. You could host a container. How well does it work? I don't really know. I'd have to look up uh, what the latest is there. Follow up with me after you got the details there. Conceptually, of course, it's not a key scenario that we really like because it's this old platform. It's not cross-platform. Nevertheless, it's important for backwards compatibility scenarios of being able to host a container. Uh, has some support, but I'd, I'd have to look that up. I don't know the answer at the top of my head. So Blazor uh, was a good question, timely question, I guess, because here's my Blazor slide. There wasn't a whole lot of Blazor content at build. I still wanted to mention, I think there's like one or two sessions. Uh, I think it was mentioned in various little sessions. Uh, the bottom line is Blazor is, is moving along nicely. It's been very popular. Desktop apps are added, added in the .NET 6 timeframe, especially for this MAUI scenario that we talked about. So question line is, a lot of updates about Blazor desktop at build. No, there weren't a lot of updates, but it was mentioned that it's coming with .NET 6. I guess it just uh, didn't get a session slot that was really dedicated to that. There's always a competition for the, for the available slots. And Blazor has received so much love in recent times anyway that Microsoft probably didn't want to talk about it a whole lot there. But it is there. It's being combined with Maui. Um, question also is, do, you, do I think Blazor is more mature for production apps uh, in its current life cycle than Maui? Yes, absolutely, because Blazor has been released for a while. It's stable. It works well. So yes, it is more mature than Maui, which is uh, one of the rougher pieces I've seen in a while, I would say. A little bit of a side note, Jim already mentioned it in its intro, uh, but we are supporting this open source initiative called Fotino, former web window. How does that fit in? Fotino is a cross-platform web-based uh, desktop view or, or rich application technology, I should say. So if you are interested in building the kind of apps that you would typically build with Electron, where you literally have just HTML with, with the typical HTML languages uh, building for a true 
cross-platform Windows, Android, iOS, Mac, but also Linux uh, application environment, just like uh, Electron is. Fotino is exactly the same thing, but based on top of Edge. And, and this is one of the big things, you can use .NET languages and technologies in Fotino as well. So it's been a cool effort, which is why we decided to put some muscle behind it and support this and push it along. Uh, but it's not just us, it's an open source uh, initiative originally uh, started by Microsoft people and, and kind of a cool platform that is, uh, we think, a better alternative if you want to build Electron style apps. We've had a recent uh, Code Presents webinar. That's our second monthly type of webinar we now do, kind of offset two weeks usually with the Stata.net events. We had one that focused on Fotino. You can go try, uh, go watch that. Just go on our CodeMac.com website. You'll find it there. Uh, go to tryfotino.io. It's a GitHub project. Uh, try it out. It's a, it's a really cool technology. We have some articles about that now in Code Magazine. Free, of course. And then just another cool alternative if you truly want to use web technologies to build a true unlimited cross-platform app that's very lightweight and based on more modern technology. So that's just a little bit of a side note. Um, one other thing that I wanted to focus on uh, that was mentioned in Build in various ways and that I think is really cool, completely different topic now. Uh, and I wanted to, it's a, it's a small tidbit of information, but I think it's very cool. And that's this technology called Playwright. It's uh, basically a UI testing framework for HTML based UIs coming from Microsoft. And you can take a look at this at playwright.dev. And I'm gonna show you a very brief demo. And I'm gonna do this simply by opening up a command line, uh, my PowerShell command line here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start the Playwright engine here from the command line. This, this is integrated in Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio as well. I'm just gonna do it from the command line. And I'm gonna show you the code generator for this. So by issuing this npx playwright code gen command, what I can do is I can launch a recording environment that will record UI testing for the web. And so let me move this over here. So here is my recorder and it also launched a web browser for me. So let me dock that in here and maybe change the sizing a little bit, make this a little bit bigger. So what this allows me to do is it allows me to record UI testing scripts. So let's say I wanna test GitHub, uh, pretend I'm the GitHub developer and I want to come in here and I want to search GitHub for .NET for instance and then click around in this, whatever whatever this might be. You see that over here, this recorder records a testing script for me. And this testing script can be recorded in a number of different languages. So right now it's JavaScript, but I could go to C Sharp if I was a C Sharp guy, or, or I could go to Python and, and all other languages as well. So as you see, this records that I'm navigating the pages, clicking things, filling in, fields, whatever you can do in a web browser, basically. And when I'm done with this script, I can stop that I can record that and, and, and save it away. And then I can run that as a UI testing script in a number of different environments that I want to run. And then of course, this execution of this script, which I can also manually create, of course, and edit. Uh, but the execution of the script becomes the main playwright feature. That's what, what you want to do. So it's a way to test the UI layer of very advanced HTML based applications. So very cool tech. I just wanted to bring that up briefly because I thought this was a really cool thing that was sorely lacking in the past. You can go to playwright.dev. Uh, it has its own website, even though it's a Microsoft technology and you can use that for all kinds of different UI testing for all kinds of different HTML UI frameworks of your choice. Doesn't, doesn't even have to be Microsoft based. If you're just a whatever React guy running on top of the Linux stack, you can still use that. So, so cool stuff that I think deserves more attention than it got. Another topic that I think is really cool, I'm picking out some tiny little areas, is Hot Reload. I've mentioned that before. This is a really cool tech 
looking forward to Visual Studio 2022 to really make that work well. I couldn't get it to work in my Visual Studio 2019 preview, even though I wanted to show that so bad today. But this is a highly productive feature for development and debugging in the .NET environments. Uh, think of this like you can change an HTML page on the fly and see it immediately update in your browser. This is for everything. Um, this is, you know, for game development, for WPF development, MAUI development, all those things that are normally uh, plagued by this long recompile, shut the app down type of cycle. So that's something that's very cool that's coming. Now, question online goes back to the Playwright stuff I showed you. Uh, Victor is asking, can Playwright record for web forms? Yes, absolutely. Anything HTML based, it can record. Another thing uh, as, a, as a last tidbit of little functionality uh, that I really like is .NET 6 and C Sharp 10 minimal APIs. So a lot of the theme as we discussed is productivity, is streamlined development. And C Sharp 10 has this feature where you can build small things and, and small things happen more and more often where we build these little islands of functionality, just a quick UI I need for the small thing and you know, we'll maybe throw it away later or a quick service I need that does just this one thing, uh, may not fit in the big picture very well. I just I need a service that just surfs up whatever. Um, and so C Sharp 10 has this ability to create basically single CS file, uh, very simple applications that don't need a static main class with the main entry points, just a piece of code that I want to run. And this is used in the .NET 6 timeframe to create APIs basically. So this is a simple code example where this, this four liner is all the code we need here. We are building up a web application we are mapping the root the, to slash whatever on the root domain to return in this case, just a string called hello world and we run this app and this stands up a whole service that can run. So very cool and you can make this a little more sophisticated. Uh, this is the weather service to the weather app we just saw before where we can map the weather for a specific location and then just run a little bit of code right in here as a Lambda and it returns the weather for this location. And this is literally the entire app. Uh, so from something that would have taken probably 150 lines of total code if you dug through your entire C Sharp app uh, goes down to some like 30 or 25 lines of code here to do something really useful. And, and so um, that's a very cool feature. Uh, that you can then easily morph into something bigger if need be. So you're not in a dead end there either, which I really like about this. So I thought this was worth highlighting just as a tidbit, a, a little nugget that I wanted to pull out. Okay, another question online, I, I guess Playwright struck a note. Uh, does Play, Playwright work with Blazor? Yes, absolutely. Blazor at the end of the day just spits out HTML and therefore you can automate it with Playwright. Another thing I want to mention here uh, is GitHub. GitHub is a big deal. And if you haven't done any GitHub yet, take a look at it. You should have a GitHub account. It's gaining in importance every day. When you watch a lot of the build sessions, you'll notice that just about every build session talks about GitHub. Uh, it talks about how you can grab code, talks about how you can get involved in community efforts, but it also talks a lot about DevOps and continued uh, continuous integration or CI, uh, GitHub Actions drive a lot of functionality. So you'll see a, no, a lot of new Microsoft dev uh, tech coming out and it always involves GitHub. So this was not in that sense a major, you know, here's a GitHub session at build, but it was there all the time. So if you're not familiar with GitHub yet, I encourage you to sign up for it and check it out. A lot of it's free, of course. Um, this is also the way forward for DevOps. Yes, Azure DevOps is still there. It'll be there forever because it's so important and so many people are using it. But in terms of new stuff, I would go with GitHub. We have a lot of stuff in Azure DevOps. I'm not moving that. That'll be fine for what it is and it'll be fine for a long time to come. But all the new things we are starting or if I was just getting into that, I would clearly use GitHub for all of that. Uh, Question is, is hot reload for everything coming out with Visual Studio 2022? Um, I believe it's supported in just about any tech. Now, 
I think it's .NET only, so it's not gonna work in C++, I don't think, so that it's not everywhere, but it's almost everywhere. And it's actually there right now in Visual Studio 2019. It just doesn't seem to work very much. <laughs> uh, so I've, I've had issues with that a lot. Uh, so not reliably enough where I would pull it up in an online demo in front of a lot of people. But it's there right now, and it will be there even more and more scenarios in Visual Studio 22. Now, talking about a lot of this uh, .NET stuff, we will have a dedicated event to .NET 5 and .NET 6 preview as our next state of .NET event. Mark your calendar is going to be, it's always last Wednesday in the month. This month is different because of build, but normally it's the last Wednesday in the month. And so our upcoming event will be focusing on .NET 6, uh, focusing on what's happened with .NET 5, but mostly .NET 6 preview. And that should be an interesting event where we dive into a lot more detail with a lot of these things. So moving along in our presentation here today, Azure. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about Azure here today, but clearly Azure is very important uh, and build was full of Azure. However, we had our Azure event last month. Go back, rewatch that. But the short version of the overall message here, Azure and cloud is the future. Uh, cloud native apps are the future. What do I mean by cloud native? Cloud native means an app that's not just hosted on the, on the cloud and kind of running on the cloud and we give it to Microsoft to make sure the servers don't go down. But I'm talking about truly taking advantage of a lot of the cloud infrastructure, the scalability, the containers, the, the reliability, uh, things like Azure or cloud specific databases that are growing limitless. I'm also talking about multi-cloud. Most people don't just use one cloud. So being able to create an app that runs across multiple clouds, whether that's Azure or, or AWS from the Amazon guys or whatever. Uh, so a, an, an application that's truly architected with the key cloud technologies in mind. And I have a slide here that limits, uh, that, that lists those, I should say. Uh, things, microservices, uh, using Kubernetes uh, to orchestrate the different pieces of your application, building APIs, serverless development, Azure Functions, uh, uh, AWS Lambdas, using continuous integration and DevOps. Uh, there's a new technology called Azure Arc that enables you to manage your cloud assets from, from the hardware to the software pieces across multiple clouds. Uh, things like AI and machine learning, Machine learning is everywhere. I don't have enough time in today's talk to go through all of these things, but it's clear that those are everywhere. I mean, you're now writing a document, machine learning kicks in. You are refactoring an app in Visual Studio, machine learning kicks in. Machine learning is everywhere. So the ability to use that more easily is a key architectural cornerstone of a lot of things. So I encourage you to go back and, and rewatch the stata.net uh, that we had last month. There's also prior events where we focus on specific things for the machine learning, for instance, we have a stata.net that's still online and you can watch for free about cognitive services as it's called on Azure. So lots of interesting stuff. I'm not focusing on this today because so many events are already focusing on that, but don't take that as, oh, nobody talked about Azure and, and, and build. Everyone talked about Azure and many of these things that I've already mentioned were uh, involving Azure all the time. So that's all I want to say about this today. I want to move into a completely different area. And this is uh, where in the, in the intro I said, I'm hoping you walk away with a little bit of a different outlook on what's going on with development. And, and that is first, uh, as one of the areas is MS Teams. Uh, Teams is this collaborative environment. If you've never used Teams, you, you know, you're probably in the minority at this point. Teams is the fastest growing Microsoft product ever. It has 145 million daily active users, not total users, but just people that use it every single day. Uh, that's more than twice what it was a year ago. And people say, well, yeah, the pandemic kicked in since then. No, a year ago, the pandemic was already in full swing. It had already grown tremendously to that point. So the trajectory of this technology 
is incredibly fast going upwards. Now, what most people don't get is that this is a very interesting developer platform. Teams is this technology that allows you to work together remotely, to do meetings, to do collaboration. And people often just see that as, oh, well, it's a Zoom competitor where I can do video meetings or it's a Slack competitor where we can chat online in our team. But it is so much more. I think that's the unique strength of Teams is that it's so much more than that. So it allows you to do things like meet with your customers online. Uh, let's say you're a furniture salesperson, as a sample or, or a demo that they had at Build, where uh, you're talking about furnishing a house and you're interacting with your customer, you schedule an online meeting. Uh, or my own sample, imagine you are a, a law firm and you want to work with your clients online and you do a meeting online. Well, you could do a Zoom meeting and you could share, say, the screen that shows a, a Word document. But that's kind of kludgy. That's very heavy handed. What if you wanted a better way to say, here's our online meeting and we can pop up our Word document and work on it together. But not just that, you can share the whole case that includes maybe hundreds of Word documents and you have the ability in teams to go into all these different documents and, and maybe you are the lawyer and you're talking to your client and your client says, oh, I just remember I have this other document, submits that document to you through that team session. That whole session then gets recorded by your backend system that has nothing to do with teams. It's a legal management system, a case management system perhaps, and it records all the things that were discussed in that meeting, including the new documents that were added. And, and you can then go back and see, oh, the, the meeting on December 5th, we did all this and that's where this document came from. So that's a much richer environment than what you could have by just doing screen sharing. So how would you create that? Well, you would create that by extending teams because Teams has become a developer platform and tremendously interesting uh, and a platform that most people don't think of. Just about anything you work off on, you can now imagine working on together within this Teams platform. And, and there's an app store in Teams. Uh, there's hundreds of apps in there that extend Teams in a way similar to what I just laid out with my law firm example. And, and that's a tremendously big developer opportunity. So we as a company are looking into that, take it very, very serious. Now, I, uh, the, the setup environment is a, is a little complex. I didn't want to mix that with my streaming setup here, but I pre-recorded uh, a, a quick demo. So let me actually roll that video of that demo here. In this particular demo, I'm going to show you how to use VS Code uh, to create the MS Teams extension. Now, you could have done the same thing in just regular Visual Studio. Uh, you would have downloaded an extension for Visual Studio to do that. In this case, I downloaded an extension uh, for Visual Studio Code through the Extensions Manager. So you can come in here, you can look for Teams. Teams. And you find uh, your Teams toolkit, and I've already installed that here, but this is what you'd install. And then you have all the tools you need to build MS Teams extensions. And as I said, a similar extension is also available uh, for full Visual Studio. So now that I've done that, I have this new Teams toolkit icon in here, and I can go into that and you see I have a pane that allows me to do various things. Let me collapse a few so you can see a little better what's going on. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do in here is I'm going to create a new project. And this is going to use a Teams template to create a Teams extension. Uh, I could start with a sample, but in this case, we're just going to start with a very simple uh, empty app. We're going to build a tab-based app, which means it's going to add a whole tab to Teams. I could have also built something that uh, would go directly into the messaging pipe. And that's very interesting because now you can extend the, the conversations that are going on. So to me, that's almost one of the most interesting types of extensions, but that will go a little bit beyond of what we are trying to do here today. Um, or you could do a bot type of extension. But anyway, um, in this case, all we're going to pick is a tab based extension. And I could uh, combine multiples here. Okay, I'm going to build an Azure based extension. Don't need any of this. And I can choose the language of choice. And I'm going to choose JavaScript here. And this is going to pull in a template that's actually a React based template. Now, there's different ways of building extensions 
Uh, this is just one sample that I picked. I'm not even a uh, particularly uh, seasoned React developer, but uh, that's just one of the default templates that we have. So let's pick a folder for this. And then here it's going to ask us to pick a name. So I'm going to call this state of .NET. And when I do that, it's now going to start downloading all kinds of stuff and uh, giving me basically a React app that has all kinds of things in here. Now we can explore what this does. Uh, one of the first things I'm going to do, however, is uh, I'm going to hit F5 and F5 is going to start building all of this. And the first time I do this, this is going to take quite a bit of time. So this is why I'm just starting this. So now it's restoring packages and doing all kinds of other stuff that it needs to do. And while that's going on, we can go ahead and we can explore some of the things that are going on here. So this is organized inside of a tabs folder because that's the type of extension we picked. In here is a source folder. And in the source folder, the index.jsx file is where it all starts. So this is, like I said, a React extension. That's just one of the options you have. You could do this differently, but this is one example. So this is where it all starts. Uh, this index.jsx starts uh, to render a new app. Uh, this app is going to use components. And in particular, it's going to use this tab component. So in this tab component, it's going to start rendering some things like a welcome message. Uh, the welcome component is registered up here. So we see it's in sample slash welcome. So we could drill into that as well. And here is welcome JSX. And this is just some default it created for us. You'll be replacing this with whatever you want. Uh, so here it says congratulations. We're just going to say state of .net. And we don't need a username for this. And it's going to say your app is running in whatever environment. And you can see it's using different placeholders that are available to you. And in fact, if we were to start digging around in this, we would notice that there's quite a few other things in here, like there's uh, other components like this uh, Azure function stuff. And you can dig around in here. There's some good sample things in here or current user. And you can see that it's actually using the Teams API functionality to integrate with Teams. So that is how this extension is going to start integrating with Teams and we're going to bridge the gap. So we are now building an app that's essentially a standard web application. And this standard web application can run anywhere. It can run in a, in a browser-based environment. It can run in the full-blown Teams client. It can run in the mobile version. So very, very generic. Um, and it can do anything a web app could do. Plus, it's running inside a Teams, hence we can use the Teams API to get all this other Teams information out of it. Uh, so that's just different stuff that you can explore in here. You see at the bottom, it's still building. So this should be almost done. And when it's done building, it's going to try to launch this. And if you did this at home, it's going to take a moment the first time around. And then the second time, once it has everything uh, uh, all the packages restored and all of that, uh, it'll go much faster. So it's now starting up a development server. So this is going to run this app locally. Ultimately, you deploy this app uh, most likely into the Teams App Store, which is a whole big environment where you can run all kinds of things. Very, very rich uh, setup. Uh, but for now, we're just running this locally and it has to do quite a few things for that. It has to do an authentication piece and it has to do the actual application. Uh, and so we should be getting close here. This should start up uh, a web browser here in a minute. And it's doing so on my other screen. So let me move this across. Here it comes. Okay, it's gonna try to sign me in. Now the first time you run an extension, you may actually be asked a number of security questions. Uh, I've already prepped this demo a few times, so it may or may not ask me, but be prepared uh, to answer a few things. Uh, and you basically want to stick with the defaults and you want to stick for this setup. You want to stick with the web client because you're running in this development mode. 
Uh, but here it goes, it says, hey, you want to install this app? Now for this app to be installable, by the way, your team setup has to support custom app loading and your admin can configure that. So if that's not the case, uh, you may run into some issues here. You didn't have to enable this and it may actually take a little while once you change the settings for this to uh, really become available. Um, if you have any trouble with that, feel free to ping me. I should be able to help you with that. Uh, but in any event, we can now say add and this installs that app into our test environment at this point. Now, ultimately, we'd actually deploy that into the app store with the, with its own manifest and everything else. And then people load it from the app store and you could exactly set up how this works. But as you can see, this is now running. And because it's a tab based application, it created this new tab over here. And we now see our application running as a stato.net, like we changed it. And everything in here is now fully customizable by us. And you can see there's some sample code in here and, and there's more information about how to go on about this. Now, because it's a tab based app, it has the tab over here. Like I said, it would be much more interesting, in my opinion, to actually tie into the meeting experience. So it's an extension to the chat, it's an extension to the video feed. You can keep track of what's going on with the video. Uh, you can log sessions. That's to me the real interesting part is that you can collaboratively work on stuff, but you can, uh, in, in addition to sharing things, you can also log what's going on and preserve that session. So whatever custom business app you have, you can now have this collaborative experience and tie into that and preserve what went back and forth and what you agreed upon perhaps, or, or the things you collaboratively worked on. But that's the basic setup. We've now extended uh, our MS team setup. And like I said, this is a React example. You could do this with many other types of, um, uh, of code and it would work just the same way. So that's my team's demo. Again, just a very brief version of what's possible. This, this is something we'll, we'll surely pick up as a separate event, maybe even a full stata.net event, maybe a code presents event, because I think there's huge opportunity here. Think of it like this, everything that was out there in the development world now basically needs a more collaborative version. And this is one way to do it. Uh, now for the development, this was a simple example. There's tons and tons of APIs you can use that you can tie into the meetings as a meeting API. There's media APIs where you can tie into the video stream, the audio stream, have real time access to that. Uh, there now also is a new together mode toolkit uh, that plays into that extensibility. If you've never used together mode, I have some screenshots here of it. Uh, together mode allows you to meet in a more natural way uh, and that's, it works especially well if you have a lot of people. So you can see here we have a lot of people that look like they're sitting in an auditorium. What it does is it takes the video feed, cuts out just the head, the silhouette, and then puts this anywhere you want it to. And it just works much, much better than having lots of tiny little postage stamp size video feeds of people with their living rooms. And it's also more fun, frankly. And there's a new toolkit around that where you can design your together mode any way you want. Uh, so the, the screenshot at the bottom is somebody had some fun with that and put people under the sea apparently. Uh, and so you can you can make cool things, but you can also make uh, uh, branded things, get your, your personal meeting experience going. Uh, very nice when you meet with customers, very, very nice uh, when you have boardroom type of meetings, very nice when you have large style meetings. So I, I really am a big fan of this together mode. So lots of interesting stuff going on here. I approached this with an open mind. I talked to a lot of developers like, oh yeah, Teams is just this meeting thing. Uh, it's not just this little meeting thing. It's a very, very substantial platform at this point. Now, the other thing I want to point out to you is the power platform. This is something that a lot of developers look at and go, ah, this is not real development. We don't really need to take a look at this. But it is very interesting and it is here to stay and it is uh, uh, very powerful. Hence, I guess the name Power Platform. So what is this? Uh, this is a platform that allows what Microsoft calls citizen developers to create applications. So it's an app builder. It's a no code type of uh, development environment. And so right there, we turn our nose up as developers and say, this is not for us. 
but hold on, there is a lot of stuff that it actually is for us. So the Power Platform is a combination of really four different things. There's Power BI, which enables business intelligence, including AI and machine learning, to get very, very rich functionality over your data. And this is really one of the things that to me makes this unique is that you can create things that are just so much more sophisticated than you can easily develop yourself typically. And it brings together a lot of these cloud technologies, these, these cloud native things that we should really use today, but a lot of us haven't started using. Then there's the Power Apps. Uh, so that's what we'll focus on here today. Power Apps is a way to build applications, very visual, similar to what you would do, say, in a, in a visual basic, build apps, bring together data from various sources. Uh, then there's Power Automate. That's more like workflow, things that are going on. You may have heard of digital twins and all that sort of where you're simulating ongoing flows over, over things. And then there's Power Virtual Agents, which is basically a bot framework. The most interesting stuff to us as developers is Power Apps. And then that uses things like Power BI. Uh, so I have another sample, another example that I pre-recorded that I'll show you here. It's a simple example. It's a simple thing that's like, oh, well, another stupid little UI builder. But keep in mind that all of this other stuff is behind it. Today, I don't have enough time to show you all of that. But again, it's probably going to be something that we'll focus another presentation, another webinar on. But it's super powerful and it's controllable by us developers. So it gives people to quickly create these islands of functionality, almost like we create microservices. It's almost like micro apps where somebody needs some functionality. We have this challenge where we can't create code fast enough. So some things people can just create themselves maybe as a starting point, uh, maybe something that will develop into something bigger later when we as developers take over. Uh, maybe just something they needed just for a little bit of time and just needed to get this need served. And still, we don't want to give up our nice architecture, our, our control, our way to get to data, our logic behind the scenes. We as developers still have a lot of uh, control over that. So it's part of the ecosystem and it's another huge opportunity. So let me roll the video that I recorded for that. In this demo, we're going to take a look at Microsoft Power Apps. And the easiest way to work with Power Apps is to first of all go to powerapps.com. If you don't have an account yet, you can simply try it out for free. I'm just going to sign in with my corporate account here. Uh, and this gives me the ability to then go ahead and to start building new Power Apps. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to start with something I've pre configured. I've given myself access uh, to a SQL server test database we have. And in this case, I'm going to create an application that looks at articles that we have in that database. Uh, this is basically a database of Code Magazine article content. Now, typically, you wouldn't give somebody access directly to SQL server. And that's one of the nice things about Power Apps is that you can completely control how you want to give access to your data. So very often you probably create some kind of API, some kind of service layer, and then grant access through that uh, will be a very common scenario. Uh, out of the box, Power Apps also provides a tremendous number, I think over 400 different connectors to different types of data and different types of applications. And so that will be another very common uh, scenario. For instance, Microsoft Graph, if you're an Office 365 or a Microsoft 365 user, I should say. But in this example, just to have a simple uh, scenario going into this test database, I'm just going straight to my articles database. Now, as you can see here, it created, based on this mobile template that I picked, it created a first UI and it provides a visual designer for this UI. So I could go in and I could say, uh, specify a text for this label, something like that. Uh, it provided a search box. It provides uh, data items here for me that it doesn't have yet. Uh, but what we could now do is we could just go ahead and we could run this. And here's our application. And I could now enter something like laser. And here it comes and it actually searches our database and finds these Blazor articles. So we have 
very, very quickly and easily been able to generate this application. Now, this isn't the world's greatest app, obviously, but this might serve a simple purpose that one of our users or one of our departments in our enterprise needed really quick and didn't want to wait for a developer to create an application, deploy it to mobile devices, jump through all those hoops. But it's just a quick way to create these kinds of applications. Now, a lot of developers are going to say, oh, wait a minute, this isn't the kind of architecture we want. This isn't uh, the quality level we want. But that's probably OK. It's not meant to be that. It's not meant to build an application that's your 18 month development effort for this big business system. It's just an island of functionality. And the cool thing about this island of functionality is that you still have a lot of control over it. You can still control how the data gets served up, for instance, what people have access to. So as a developer, this is actually more likable than you might think at first because you're not giving up all that control. It's just a quick and dirty way, if you want to think of it like that, for a user to create this small island of an application that's in the big picture relatively insignificant as far as having some gold-plated architecture goes. Uh, the, the consequences of this application are probably relatively low, and therefore it doesn't have to be this great architecture and, and this high level of quality. Just a quick thing that somebody uses, probably grows a little bigger, adding some functionality, but at the end of the day, it's a, a relatively small island of functionality that nevertheless can be tremendously useful. And what you don't see in this simple example here that I've created here is there's so much more to this whole power platform. There's graphs and stats. There's AI that's built in it. And, and that's really one of the key concepts that I think uh, we shouldn't overlook is that this is a great way to get to some of those advanced concepts like AI that would be very difficult to build otherwise. And so don't think of this just as, uh, you know, the next version of, of Visual Basic or the next version of Visual Studio Light Switch or something like that, but it really brings to the table the whole power of the cloud with all these other related services like machine learning. And, and as such, it's a, it's a great addition to the tool belt. It's a great way to serve this need of very quickly pushing out these small islands of functionality. And the way I look at it, it's just like it's often not that important that your services are super great in architecture because they become throwaway pieces once they serve their purpose and they're not sinking the whole ship in terms of, oh my God, we now have to maintain this for the next 20 years. Uh, if it is something that you have to maintain for the next 20 years, then this probably isn't what you want to use. But if it's not, then this can be a great addition to your tool belt as a developer, but also to people that are technical, but are not uh, what we would call, quote unquote, real developers. Um, so take it for what it's worth. But I think uh, if you approach this with an open mind, you'll find this much more useful than you probably thought you would. So that's my Power BI or Power App demo. Uh, again, approach with an open mind. There's so much there. You can extend the model that this has. Uh, you can create things like connectors to decide how do you get to your information. Again, typically not straight to the database. Uh, you can create UI controls uh, that people can then use inside the Power App. You can create services and APIs. So there's a lot there for the developers. So these last two topics I showed you, the teams, and the power platform, I hope you really give a chance, you come away open-minded and with kind of a new outlook on what you can do as a developer. There's gonna be tremendous benefit for a business in those two platforms. Uh, so you'll, you'll get great productivity, hopefully advantages over your competitors, a better way to work in this distributed world. Uh, and for a developer, there's tremendous opportunity there in terms of just well, to say bluntly, to, to work and, and make money. I think there's a huge market there. So approach it open-minded. And these platforms, I actually, as I find them uh, quite good and interesting. And as a business, we'll put a lot into that. Now, that brings us to the end of the presentation. I'm already way over time again, but uh, you already know that I usually do that when you come to these events. A few other announcements. Uh, again, please fill out the survey. 
You can get a gift certificate. Uh, from my point of view, you would really do us a favor if you can help us out with that because we always use that to fine tune future events, see what people are interested in, basically deliver a better experience in these online events for you. Um, if you now sit there thinking, wow, this is some cool stuff. I wonder how this applies to me. We offer this free hour of consulting. It's been popular. It's first come, first serve. Uh, so this is something a lot of people have been doing. So schedule yours early if you want to get it in. Uh, that's something you can do. There's no strings attached. No, you know, you don't have to put down your credit card or anything like that. If it's an hour and a half, it's an hour and a half. You know, it's a, a, a pretty flexible thing we're doing. Also, in general, consider us a resource is what I always tell people. If you have a question, send us an email. Uh, we promise to answer all the emails we have. Uh, we get personally gotten a little overwhelmed with uh, all these events we're doing so it may take a while send it to Jim Duffy his email address is on the slide right here as well it usually gets you a quicker answer but I will respond to all the emails I do get I promise uh, and if I don't answer within a week or two send another one because I may have just overlooked it or may have gotten the spam if you're a Code Magazine reader uh, and you should be at this point you probably have gotten a free subscription somewhere check out our mobile app iOS and Android has been supported for well over a year now and we are still considering the crisis to be ongoing and we made a statement a year ago that was as long as the crisis is ongoing uh, we will give it away for free so we are still doing that uh, it's all free uh, you get Code Magazine as a Microsoft benefit uh, the old MSDN subscription what's now called a VSS or a Dev E subscription uh, even the free stuff you qualify for a Code Magazine subscription pass that on to your friends uh, they get that as well. And mark your calendars for future events. Uh, we're going to talk about Stata.net again, .NET 5, .NET 6 on June 30th. Uh, so just four weeks away. Uh, also, in between, we're now always doing these Code Presents webinars. Uh, in this case, uh, Jeff Callahan, one of my key developers, is going to talk about desktop and, and deployment. Uh, so we know that desktop development has been a hugely popular topic. Uh, somewhat to our surprise I'll admit and so we've had a lot of questions around that this came from a lot of the surveys so we're doing a code presents webinar just on that again it's free and that's on June the 16th two weeks from now and that's it uh, thank you very much for attending I'm gonna hang around a little bit longer in case there are questions but again feel free to send us your emails we're not the kind of company that's gonna send you a bill for a, for a quick email answer uh, either to myself or to Jim Duffy. The email addresses are on the slide here. You can also download these slides from stateof.net.com, uh, which really gets you to codemac.com slash uh, We'll upload both the recording of this event as well as the slide deck uh, here. The slide deck will be available shortly after the event. The recording usually takes a day or so. So thank you very much for attending. Hope you found this useful and uh, hope to see you again at the next Co-Presents or State of .NET uh, presentation.